don't even have data already that you can work up. Oh. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Luana Lamberti, and I'm a PhD candidate from Ohio State University in Hispanic Linguistics. My research focuses on upper varieties of Spanish spoken in Cuba and of Portuguese spoken in Bahia, Brazil. Th this talk is part of, uh, of the Abrelin Ao Vivo event, Linguists Online, that is organized by Abrelin, the Brazilian Linguistics Association, in cooperation with several international associations, such as the Permanent International Linguistics, Linguists Committee, the Latin American Linguistics and Philology Association, the Argentinian Society of Linguistics Studies, the Linguistic Society of America, the Societas Linguistica Europea, the Linguistics Association of and the Linguistics Association of Great Britain. Please remember that it is important to be an Abrelin associ associate to support linguistics in Brazil. I'm here to introduce Professor Sarah Thomason, who is a distinguished university professor at the University of Michigan, former editor of the journal Language, and the only woman to have edited that journal in its over 90 years of publication. A fellow American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science, the recipient of Lifetime Achievements Awards from several scholarly societies, and co-author of a book so influential that it, it has been cited over 10,000 times. Her research spe specialties includes, includes historical linguistics and language contact, with a focus on principles of language uh, of contact induced language change and contact language genesis uh, of pigeons, creoles, and bilingual mixed uh, languages. She also specializes in Montana Salish linguistics. She has spent every summer since 1981 working with elders to prepare a dictionary and a text collection of the language. In her spare time, she has fun debunking linguistic, uh, linguistic pseudoscience. Within the era of language context, Professor Thomason is recognized as the world's authority. She is the first author of the now classic book, Language Context, Creolization and Genetic Linguistics with Professor Terence Kaufman in which she argued that language history must be studied with, ref uh, with reference to social context. Her approach was in clear contrast to the view of historical linguists over the previous 150 years or so that nearly all language change is triggered by factors internal to the language itself. Through careful documentation of complex context situations from around the world, the book ushered in a new area, era in the study of language relationships. Professor Thomason's fieldwork involving language context situations has over the course of the past 30 years led to a quite distinct and highly respected ex expertise in the native languages of the Northwestern uh, United States. She has published in an online edition of her S Salish English Dictionary, the result of her many years of language documentation work. Her book, Endangered Languages, an introduction from 2015, has already become a standard textbook in reference work on the topic of endangered languages and their preservation. Finally, she's not only a highly influential scholar, but a beloved mentor and is well known for her engagement with an interest in his student work. In the name of Abrelin, I would like to thank Professor Thomason very much to participate on this event. And now Professor Thomason will present her talk entitled Deliberated language change, why, how, and does it matter? Thank you. Thank you very much, Luana. Thank you. <laughs> that extraordinarily generous introduction. Let me see if I can get the slides to work. There. I hope people can see the slides. Um, Hello, everyone. It's hard to know if anyone's out there, but I know Luana is, Luana is because there she is on the screen. Um, I have to start because there has been so much awful stuff going on in the United States where I am. In the last few days, um, I have to say my talk has absolutely nothing to do with politics, but even so, I, I feel I, I must start the talk by saying Black lives matter. And um, then I will go on from there. Um, I'm talking about deliberate language change, as Luana said in her introduction. And I am 
hoping that I can, there we are. There's the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to give four preliminary comments and then talk about six motives with examples, why people introduce deliberate changes into their language, accommodation, distancing, secrecy, standardization, censure avoidance, and identity construction. And then why does why bother? That is, does any of this matter? And finally, a very brief conclusion. So, that didn't work very well. First preliminary, um, why bother? That is, um, is there any doubt that deliberate changes occur? Is there any controversy about whether they occur? The answer to that is yes. Uh, in fact, there's quite a long tradition for more than 100 years that says, no, you don't get changes like this, not significant deliberate changes anyway. Uh, here are a few examples. Max Müller in 1861 said, it is not in the power of man to produce or prevent changes in language. Edward Sapir, I didn't mean to do that. Edward Sapir in 1921 said a speaker engaged in a change is not an agent, but a victim. Noam Chomsky and Morris Halla in 1968, Sound Pattern of English assumed the adult's inability to modify his grammar except by the addition or elimination of a few rules. Roger Lass, an eminent historical linguist in 1997 said the mistake in functionalist explanations of language change is considering language change to be something that speakers do rather than something that happens to their languages. And Henning Anderson, another distinguished historical linguist in 2005 said, surely no individual has the power to change a language deliberately or otherwise, nor are languages known to change as the result of speakers collective deliberate decision. Probably the best known proposal about deliberate language change is, changes is um, Bill LaBoff's 1994 he says changes from above are introduced by the dominant social class, often with full public awareness. Changes from below are systematic changes that appear first in the vernacular and represent the operation of internal linguistic factors at the outset. And through most of their development, they are completely below the level of social awareness. Now, Leboff was talking, of course, about um, Western societies with dominant classes and less dominant classes. Uh, a lot of my examples, as you'll see, are gonna be from hunter-gatherer societies and others that don't have such clear class distinctions. Leboff doesn't say the changes from above, that is the deliberate changes have to be relatively minor, but his example suggests that he thinks so. Um, and I think um, this view is uh, supported by something he says much later in his 1994 book, there is a part of language behavior that is subject to conscious control, to deliberate choice, to purposeful and reflective behavior. But as far as I can see, it is not a major part of the language faculty and it has relatively little influence on the long range development of language structure. So the traditional view is deliberate language change is not something you need to worry about. It's not at all likely to have more than very minor influence on a linguistic system. I disagree. My own view is quite radical. I think speakers can change anything in their language they can become aware of, given a powerful enough motive. They have to have a reason, a good reason for doing it. I hope to convince you today that my view, well, today, uh, it's afternoon where I am, it's evening where a lot of you are. I hope to convince you that my view is closer to the truth than the traditional view is. So second preliminary. Most of the changes I'm gonna talk about are either ongoing or potential changes, not completed, completed ones. Um, partly that's because getting evidence for deliberate changes is difficult, except in cases of very recent changes. But partly it's because I think I'm radical in this too, that any novel utterance, even a one-time speech error is a potential linguistic change. Uh, whether it becomes an actual change in a single person's speech or in a whole language uh, depends on linguistic and especially on social factors. Um, so for me, a potential change is a perfectly relevant thing, even if it's not likely to become an actual change. Third preliminary, how do you know when a linguistic innovation and maybe its spread as well was deliberate? Sometimes you know for sure, somebody said, I did this, or 
so-and-so did this, or you saw them do it, you heard them do it, uh, or it happened as part of language planning, which uh, leaves records. But much more often, we don't know for sure. We can make reasonable inferences when uh, it happened too fast to be ordinary language change. I am not going to try to define ordinary. Or the change was not ordinary. I will get back to this later. Fourth and last preliminary, are deliberate changes made with speakers' full conscious awareness? Uh, this, this is a tricky point. Um, I'm prepared to defend my answer, um, but I can imagine fairly reasonable people disagreeing. Um, I'd say sometimes, not always. And citing from uh, Howard Giles and colleagues who've written about uh, communication accommodation theory, it should be noted that use of terms such as strategies and intentions does not necessarily apply that these purposive behaviors are always performed or evaluated consciously with full awareness. Um, Giles and his colleagues are specifically talking about accommodation, which is just one of the motives I've identified for deliberate changes. Um, but since speakers can either accommodate their speech to other people's speech or not accommodate their speech, the choice to accommodate, it seems to me, or not, uh, can reasonably be claimed to be deliberate, even if it's not made with full conscious awareness. So why do people sometimes change their languages deliberately? Motives vary, and the motives are not all mutually exclusive. So teenagers might accommodate to their peers with, say, teenage slang, that would be motive number one, accommodation, while simultaneously distancing their speech from that of their elders. That's motive number two, distancing. I want to get, begin with the motive, number one, that's been most discussed in the literature, and that's accommodation. Uh, most discussed because of Giles' Giles's work and his colleagues' work. Uh, it goes like this. When people interact, they adjust their speech, their vocal patterns, and their gestures to accommodate to others. And accommodation is both a way of promoting solidarity and a way of fitting in so you're not seen as different, other, and inferior. Uh, Giles and his colleagues also talk about distancing changes, the opposite of accommodation within dialects of a single language. Um, in general, their examples are a lot less extreme than mine, so I won't be talking about any of their examples for that. Here are a few examples of accommodation. First one comes from the Old Testament of the Bible. More of the Ephraimites would have survived after fighting the Gileadites if they had been able to accommodate their sibilant to that of the victorious Gileadites. Here's the quotation from Judges, book of the Old Testament. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said to him, unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, nay, then said they unto him, say now Shibboleth, and he said Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. The kinds of adjustments studied in general by um, people working in the framework of accommodation theory are typically unconscious. Uh, some people call them deliberate, but unconscious. Um, and these types of accommodations are more likely to be subconscious than most of the examples I've found, although some of the examples from the other motives, most, some of the examples uh, resulting from motive five, censure avoidance, may well be subconscious. But some accommodations are definitely conscious. Here's an example from the language I do fieldwork on, Montana Salish, also Salish Kutlispe, known for the names of the tribes. Um, this is a set of real utterances produced by one of the very last fluent speakers of the language. It's certainly not a completed change. It's not even an ongoing change. It was a potential change. It was a unique event. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of sentences in Montana Salish. They're both completely grammatical, but only the second one is a typical way of translating an English ditransitive sentence in isolation, that is without any discourse context. I was working that day with ditransitives. This particular speaker, Joe Aeneas, during this one elicitation session, kept giving me Salish translations like one. Uh, and this sentences like this are absolutely bizarre with no context. 
literally Johnny Steele bleak particle hide from Mary. Johnny stole a deer hide from Mary. He kept giving me sentences like this, which you will notice are just about word for word, identical to English. And I finally uh, couldn't stand it any longer. And I said, Joe, aren't these sentences kind of Englishy? And he was very surprised. I said, well, yeah, I mean, you were asking me in English. I thought that's what you wanted. I said, ah, so suppose you weren't thinking of English. How would you say them naturally in your language? And he said, oh, well, then I would say, not um, which you'll notice looks very different. First of all, the word order is different. It's VOS, which is the dominant word order. Um, second, it's got a whole lot of transitive morphology on the verb um, and it differs in a few other respects as well. So um, other field workers have run into similar things. And as I said, this was a one-time occurrence of Englishy ditransitives. It was unique in my decades long experience with the language, but it's a possible change. I can't imagine that it would happen. First of all, there are hardly any fluent native speakers left. And second, nobody else ever gave me sentences like that. But if constructions like one were to replace constructions like two as the usual unmarked way of saying such things, um, the language's morphosyntactic structure would be profoundly changed, and it's a possible change. Here's another example of accommodation in a fieldwork setting. This one is um, by bilingual Niska English speakers uh, from uh, Marie-Lucie Tarpon's work. Um, she says Niska object pronouns are normally used only for emphasis, so they're deleted under identity with the object of a previous clause. So as if you had an English sentence, they heard him but couldn't see, and the second object pronoun is deleted. But often in elicitation sessions, according to Tarpon, the Niska speaker strives to approximate the English utterance, inserting non-emphatic object pronouns in Niska so that it's more like English. They heard him but couldn't see him. And although that too is a potential change in the language in Niska, not, a, not an ongoing change as far as I can tell from Tarpon's work, here's an example of accommodation that is an ongoing change, not yet completed, I don't think. Um, this is in Ahna, an Athabascan language spoken in Alaska has a very traditional, very elaborate directional system oriented to the rivers and the rivers don't all flow in the same directions. Uh, and the directional system varies depending on which river they're using as their reference point. But now that system is being replaced by the much more boring English system, east, west, north, south, and things like that. Um, this is a this is an ongoing change, not just a potential change. And it's a typical case of accommodation. I mean, this is one of the most common, perhaps the most common type of contact induced change. Second motive, distancing. Distancing changes are made in, so to increase the speaker's linguistic distance from some other guy or more likely a community's linguistic distance from a neighboring community which speaks a closely related dialect or language. Um, it's a common phenomenon in New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea at least. Uh, Kulik um, wrote in 1992, New Guinean communities have purposely fostered linguistic diversity because they've seen language as a highly salient marker of group identity They've cultivated linguistic differences as a way of exaggerating themselves in relation to their neighbors. One of my favorite, in fact, my very favorite example of distancing um, comes from Papua New Guinea. This is uh, a dialect of a language called Buin, spoken on Bougainville Island, um, which is, belongs to Papua New Guinea. Uh, the dialect is called Uisai. Buin has about 15,000 speakers. Uisai has about 1,500. The language has a very elaborate system of feminine and masculine agreement. So nouns are lexically marked for feminine or masculine and verbs and noun modifiers and I think other things in the sentence agree with um, the noun and gender. Uisai has reversed all the lexical gender assignments. Every noun in Uisai that is feminine is masculine in the other Buin dialects. Every noun in Uisai that's masculine is feminine in the other Buin dialects. So if you ask, could 
this change have happened by way of gradual unconscious change? Well, no, first of all, it's too fast. Uh, these are dialects of the same language. So you're talking about um, a thousand years or less of separation. Um, and it's also, it really is also too weird. You, you, you don't find changes like this in languages with this kind of reversal of uh, either or grammatical category. Papua New Guinea is not unique in having um, distancing cultures. Uh, there's a dialect of, Lambaye, of Quechua called Lambayeque Quechua in Peru, where speakers distorted their words so that they'd make them less like the neighbor's words. And to do this, they metathesize some vowel consonant sequences to consonant vowel. So from Yawara, you get Yaura, Yurak to Yurka, Kabalta to Kablata, Tak to Tka, and Pist to Tsi. And there's hyperdialectism. Peter Trudgill has written about this. Uh, one of his examples is postvocalic R's uh, along the borderlands, on the rhotic side of the borderlands between rhotic and non rhotic English dialects, rhotic with postvocalic R, non rhotic without postvocalic R. Speakers on the rhotic side of the border stuck a postvocalic R in words where there never had been any. Uh, so instead of something, I don't know the vowels of the dialect, but something instead of something like walk, calf, straw, and daughter, you get ork, carf, straw, and daughter. According to Trudgill, we can regard hyperdialectal R on the rhotic side of the rhotic non rhotic border areas as a way of reacting to and resisting new non rhotic pronunciations, since it's obvious that throughout English, rhotic. England, sorry, rhotic pronunciations are receding quite rapidly in the face of non-rhotic. I only have one example of this, but distancing changes are used to emphasize differentness, and I doubt if this is unique, it's just the only one I've come across, even when the other language isn't related at all, that is even when you don't have closely related languages or dialects. There's a mixed Bantu Cushitic language in Tanzania called Ma'a, hardly spoken anymore, but still surviving, at least as late as the 1960s. Um, and one feature that's preserved in Cushitic lexical items, but alien to the local Bantu languages, is a voiceless lateral fricative sh. Uh, some Bantu languages have sh, but they're southern Bantu languages, not Tanzanian ones. All Ma'a speakers are bilingual or trilingual, so they're fluent in at least one Bantu language and in fact, dominant Bantu speakers now. And they introduce shla into Bantu words so that their Bantu speech is less Bantu-like um, to distance themselves. Uh, it's considered a difficult sound that the non-Ma'a Bantu speakers in their neighborhood can't pronounce. Third motive, secrecy making deliberate changes to keep your communication secret from outsiders. And in most cases, this is lexical. That is, most of the examples are lexical. Teenage slang is a classic type of example, not just in the United States, but also elsewhere. And if I had more examples, I would have given them from African urban youth slangs, which are multilingual as well as being distancing. Um, Many of the words that are candidates for the word of the year at the annual meeting of the American Dialect Society uh, fit into this category. Stan, Zaddy, and OK Boomer uh, were among the, the winners in um, the 2019 contest. Um, and the idea is that those words are understood by the teenagers, but not by their elders or not by any non-teenagers, not by little kids either maybe. Sometimes words are disguised by lexical distortion, um, sort of what happened with the uh, Lambayeque Quechua, uh, although that was for distancing, but not um, secrecy, presumably. Might have been secrecy now that I think about it. This is Lunfardo, which I heard about some time ago in Argentina. Uh, where a lot of Spanish words get distorted by metathesis. I hesitate to pronounce these because I don't know Spanish, uh, but um, 
I'll try feca con chile from cafe con leche and gomia from amigo and quite extensive distortions of that type. My favorite example is a language called Moki. I don't know if it's still spoken. It was reported from Balochistan in the early 20th century. Balochistan, now part of Pakistan. It was the secret language of the Lordis, uh, Indic speakers. And they spoke it according to the British civil servant who was working on the census of India at the time under the British Raj and who investigated it and discovered it. They spoke it when they wanted to keep their meaning to themselves. And Bray said it was acquired naturally and as a matter of course by Lordy children. Uh, Bray was obviously extremely puzzled by this because he said it's a hodgepodge. It doesn't look like a real language, but on the other hand, you've got first language speakers, so it's hard to dismiss it. This is how it was created according to Bray. Take any word from any language and turn it inside out. Chukak, dog from Brahui Kuchak, Randum, man from Persian Mardum, etc. But although this is their chief device for obscuring the meanings of everyday words, there are several others. Sometimes they add a suffix, prefixes are affected still more, or they resort to sound changes. Both Brahui and Baloch admit freely that Moki is beyond them. The Lordis uh, were somewhat um, oppressed in the community by Brahuis and Baloch, Baluchis and they had good reason to have a secret language. Extreme cases are when a whole new language is created as a way of keeping outsiders outside. Um, I've found several examples, widely separated places. Uh, here are three of them, and I'll say a little bit about Hirimotu and Papua New Guinea, Pigeon Delaware in the United States, what is now the United States, and Pigeon Hamad in Ethiopia. And you could compare um, men's version of Maidanach, an, um, an Austronesian language of Taiwan. So this is part of a hunting ritual. Uh, the lexicon of the men's language involves metathesis and sound substitutions and word replacement so that there is a whole lexicon different from women's lexicon. Hidimotu, a lot of these reports come from missionaries. Um, the, one of the early missionaries in what is now Papua New Guinea was a man named Laws. And um, they wouldn't teach him their true language. He thought he was learning the real language, Motu. Um, but what they were actually giving him was a simplified form of the language. And the trick was revealed when his little son, Frank, uh, came in one day. He'd learned real Motu from playing with the kids in the village and he broke the news to his father that he wasn't speaking real Motu. And even then Laws had trouble convincing the villagers to teach him their real language because they didn't really want to give that knowledge to a stranger. Pigeon Delaware, uh, same problem with missionaries, but one of them, some of them just didn't notice that they weren't getting the real Delaware language, Lenape. But one Dutch missionary, Jonas Michaelis did. He said they rather designed to conceal their language from us than to properly communicate it, except in things which happen in daily trade, saying that it's sufficient for us to understand them in that. And then they speak only half sentences, shortened words, and all things which have only a rude resemblance to each other, they frequently call by the same name. And Pigeon Hammer, again, uh, this was a missionary couple. For the next seven months, we lived in Hammer villages without any interpreter or intermediary between ourselves and the Hammer. At the end of the seven months, we felt we had achieved a working knowledge of Hammer. Today, we realized that the language which we had learned was a kind of pigeon Hammer, which is used only for and by policemen, traders, and non Hammer settlers. Very effective way of keeping outsiders outside, um, particularly if you aren't discovered. Fourth motive, standardization. All standardization processes will have deliberate changes involved or creations, um, including, for instance, selection of dialect variants when you're trying to standardize a language that has a lot of dialect variation. Uh, in standardization processes, you especially get lexical creations and selections, but sometimes you also get structural features. And one particularly impressive example um, was what the revered uh, reformer, language reformer, Johannes Avik did in Estonia early in the 20th century. He thought that there were too many long words 
And apparently he thought the German had some good ideas that maybe um, Estonian could adopt. So he invented a couple hundred words and he also introduced some morphological and syntactic features, uh, including inflectional morphemes, like a synthetic superlative inspired by German. Quite a few of his innovations caught on and became part of the newly standardized Estonian. Um, uh, one commentator said his successful innovations are proof that arbitrarily coined new derivational inflectional morphemes can be wholly accepted by language users and incorporated into the language. Um, that commentator sounded a bit surprised by this. I don't find it surprising. But in this case, you're talking about a single person responsible for the changes. Um, he was held in great respect. Presumably that's why it happened, why it worked. Um, as far as I know, that's unusual. You certainly get uh, effects of standardized zeals in English. Uh, I've seen various stories about where the ban on split infinitives came from. I mean, supposedly from Latin because the infinitive in Latin is a suffix, so you can't split it. And you can't say to always go um, in Latin, at least not with a split infinitive. Uh, but as I say, various stories, either this one guy in the 18th century or a century later. Uh, the ban on double negatives, again, there seems to be some doubt about when this happened, but the goal was to make English agree with formal logic. Preposition stranding against it, um, 17th century, there are quite a few things like that. Like, I'm a standardizer, I have the power, let's invent some rules. Sometimes it works. Fifth motive, censure or ridicule avoidance. This is a joint research project with Kenneth Olson of SIL. Um, and most of the examples are ones he turned up. Uh, sometimes people change their language to keep other people from laughing at them or worse, worse, for instance, in the case of those Ephraimites who weren't able to code switch so that they sounded like Iliadites. Some of these changes could fall under the general heading of accommodation, not all of them, but some of them could but they seem to me to differ because these are based on fear or at least social anxiety rather on just promoting social solidarity. Um, all the examples we found have to do with sound suppression. I would not be surprised. In fact, I'm sure there are examples that have to do with uh, other structural features. Uh, but sound suppression seems to be particularly prominent, partly because most of them, most of the examples I've got have to do with sounds you can see, you can like bilabial trills and things you can see people doing. Um, people suppress sounds, phonemes or allophones that strike outsiders as peculiar or offensive. Uh, Palosari and Campbell uh, wrote about Teotepeke uh, Pipil, that sh is being replaced by r because the fricative sh is stigmatized, considered undesirable by Spanish speakers, that is by bilingual speakers, presumably. Uh, I don't know if this is a potential change or an actual change, I'm not sure, whether it's stigmatized or actually disappearing. There's Pitaha, um, the Amazonian language that's gotten a lot of attention in the syntactic literature in the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, in this language, speakers suppress their bilabial trill, <laughs> which I can't do unless I'm drinking something, and their voiced lateralized apical alveolar sublaminal labial double flap with aggressive lung air. Um, I can't say that I actually can pronounce that last sound, um, but I've seen video with Peter Haas doing it. So if you can see me in the little box up there, it looks like this. The tongue comes completely out of the mouth. Um, and these sounds are optional allophones of B and G, respectively. That is the bilabial trill is an allophone of B and the R is an allophone of G. This is probably an ongoing change rather than just a potential change. Uh, Dan Everett's the one who's written about this, published about this. He says, it appears that these two sounds have a high possibility of being replaced completely by their phonological alternatives because of derisive remarks from outsiders, usually rubber workers or traders. Uh, and Everett lived among the Pinaha for three months before people used those sounds in speaking to him. He never heard them at all from men. He did hear women using them talking to each other. A uh, similar phenomenon in several Bantu C languages. I don't have a map here of Bantu classification with the old ABC 
geographical designations, um, but a sequence of mb with a labial trills being replaced by mb with just a plain b in a number of languages, Bozaba, Lobala, Bomboma, Zando, and others. Um, the original uh, sequence with the labial trill was recorded in 1950, and the book commented then that young people were losing the sound. And he said that adults also have a tendency to replace the trill with an ordinary B when they speak with white people. Uh, skip ahead to 1985. By then, the trills were gone in all of the languages except uh, Bozaba. So this is a nearly completed change, completed in most of the languages where it occurred. Another example in Mandaya in the Philippines, there's a um, apical an interdental approximate, apical interdental approximate, uh, um, and there is said to be strong pressure to identify with the Cebuanos and drop this allophone. While we were alone, this is a field worker talking about one speaker, the speaker used the interdental approximant, but when several Cebuano speakers gathered around and began to laugh each time he used it, he quickly dropped the allophone where it normally occurred. Uh, and uh, according to this field worker, there are similar changes going on in a couple of other, at least two other uh, Philippine languages. This is a case of accommodation, clearly. It's also an ongoing change. In some languages of Vanuatu, uh, including Mavea, um, lingual labials are being lost. Again, you can see the sound, it comes out, the tip of the tongue is visible. Um, and they're being lost in part because younger speakers, quote, find the way lingual labials are pronounced laughable, to say the least. This is an ongoing change. On another continent, Nanti, um, a Peruvian Amazonian language, uh, X and X, which are allophones of K and G respectively, are suppressed and replaced by K and G or G in certain social situations, according to Lev Michael, especially when they're talking to speakers of the closely related language, Matsugenka. As far as I know from what Lev Michael told me, this is a potential change, not an actual one. And uh, two other potential changes. Um, and here the situation is similar to what Everett found, Everett found with Pinaha in the New Guinea language, Northwest New Guinea language, Dotai, speakers suppressed implosives for about three weeks while Mark Donahue, Donahue was studying the language, then it surfaced after a while, after they got comfortable with him and trusted him, I guess. Um, and there's a dialect of Sika, which has a labiodental flat, uh, but they don't say it to outsiders. So it's a fairly common uh, phenomenon. And uh, the last example of it that I'd like to give is a, a mystery. Um, for at least one speaker, the Tuea dialect of Tso, an Austronesian language spoken in Pungu, Taiwan, um, has pulmonic ingressive fricatives. The story begins around 1988 uh, when a student of mine named Mike Fuller in a phonetics class um, uh, for his fieldwork project was working with a man named Avai Akwayana Neahosa, a divinity student in Pittsburgh, so at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Avai was called Frank, uh, and he was from Pungu. Uh, Mike elicited a 200-word Swedish list and some other basic vocabulary for his fieldwork project. And he came to me uh, shortly after he started working on it and said, Sally, didn't you tell us that there are no languages in the world with ingressive phonemes, speech sounds? And I said, well, yeah, there's that ritual language in Australia, but otherwise not. And he said, I think I've got them in my language. And I said, no, you don't. And so he played me the tape and he did. Uh, they're extremely, um, extremely salient. You can't mishear them. Uh, they're only word initial. There are two of them, the <gasps> and a f. Um, they usually occur before glottal stop and a vowel, occasionally before an oral stop or affricate or nasal stop. And then I've got three examples where there's a glottal stop followed by a stop or affricate. Um, they sound roughly like this. Uhu, ue, tsuyu, koi, and muyu. Tsuyu. As opposed to ordinary pulmonic egressive fricatives in other environments like intervocala, kofoia, pahisi, tuhumu, naho, and so forth. 
So after the term was over, I got Mike to write up his paper because whoever heard of such a thing and send it to the Journal of the International Phonetic Association. And uh, the editor at the time was Ian Madison. And we sent him a videotape of Frank pronouncing these sounds. Um, and the paper was published uh, in the JIPA in 1990. Peter Latifoged, a super eminent uh, UCLA phonetician, was uh, naturally interested in this. Uh, so he and colleagues went to visit Pungu and ended up writing a paper saying pulmonic ingressive phones do not occur in so, and that was published three years later in the same journal. So the mystery is, why did Mike Fuller find pulmonic ingressive fricatives and Latifog and his colleagues didn't? I have thought of three possible explanations. Fuller cheated, Frank cheated, or they do exist in Pungu Tso and Latifog had missed them. Fuller didn't cheat. Um, the tapes, the videotape, I heard the sounds, I heard Frank pronounce the sounds, Mike brought him to my office. And Ian Madison wouldn't have published the paper without that videotape. Uh, I don't believe Frank cheated, um, not just because he was a divinity student and one of the most earnest people I've ever encountered and did not appear to have a sense of humor, although I might just not have seen that, but also because he didn't know what Mike was interested in. Um, he didn't, he wasn't a phonetician, he wasn't a linguist, he didn't have any notion that there was something weird about these sounds. I think what happened is that Pungu speakers suppressed those fricatives when uh, Latifoga, accompanied by, I believe, Chinese linguists, rather than, um, that is ethnic Chinese uh, professors in Taiwan, rather than um, local linguists, um, I think they suppressed them. Uh, or if Frank was somehow unique and had a speech impediment, except he didn't have a speech impediment, uh, at least they suppressed the fact that Frank had them because they denied they'd ever heard such a thing. Um, there are known instances of sound suppression around outsiders in order to avoid ridicule by outsiders. Uh, and those pulmonic aggressive fricatives were really sailing at you. <laughs> to you, <laughs> to you. I mean, you could see the whole chest moving. Um, and if you think about the pinaha labial trill and the and the pipil sh and the mandaya and the lingual labials and mavea and so forth, and some of the Bantu languages uh, by labial trills hidden from whites, the implosives in doti hidden from Mark Donahue, uh, the seco labial dental flap hidden from outsiders. That twist so case would actually fit quite well in this picture. I can't prove it. I'd love it if somebody else did. And I can't think of any other explanation. Okay, six motive. How am I doing on time? Six motive. Um, the most extreme cases of deliberate language change are those bilingual mixed languages that are created rapidly to serve as in-group languages for new ethnic or sub-ethnic groups. I think there are other mixed languages, I know of at least one, and that's Ma'a, that seem to have uh, emerged gradually. And although they certainly serve as in-group language, that certainly serves as an in-group language, I don't put it in this category because I can't prove that any of what goes on in it is deliberate. But in the case of the rapidly created um, mixed languages that serve as in-group languages, neither component, neither input languages component is distorted. That is, you get maybe the lexicon from one language and the grammar from another or part of the grammar from one language and part of the lexicon. Um, but the point is that the creators have to have been fluent bilinguals. They have to have been fluent in both languages. And that means that these languages cannot have arisen during a process of first language acquisition. They have to have been created by adults or at least not by very young children. Uh, the three that have been most studied uh, are Michif, uh, spoken in still in North Dakota and Manitoba and a few other places. A mixture of Cree, Algonquian verb phrases and sentence structure and French noun phrases. And in the French noun phrases, the lexicon, the phonology and the morphosyntax are French, uh, although there's some Algonquian leakage into it. Um, they, a mischief is spoken by the Métis people. Métis means mixed. They had European, the original 
community, he had European fathers and Algonquian mothers. Second, um, Yedni Aliut, uh, spoken in Russia on one of the two, no, no longer spoken there, but until it was the people, a few last few people were moved to mainland Russia. Um, but these are, it was spoken on one of the two commander islands off the far east coast of Russia. Um, it's basically Aleut, although there are quite a few Russian borrowings, but it has a complete Russian system of finite verb inflection. That is, a finite verb inflection is just lifted wholesale from Russian. The non-finite verbal things like subordination, um, that's all Aleut, but the finite verb inflection is Russian. This too was a mixed blood population with Russian fathers and Aleut mothers. And then media lingua spoken in, in the Andes, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, the lexicon is Spanish, the entire lexicon basically, and the structure is Quechua, entire structure. Uh, these were not mixed blood people, they were um, urbanized Quechuas. They had, the young men at least had gone to the city to build buildings and things and uh, had gotten partly acculturated and then went back home and this is their language. So just a couple of examples, one example from each of them. Here's a Mitchiff sentence, uh, la jument, jument, la juma, that's from French la jument. Um, and then kia yao eo uh, with a, an Algonquian a Cree verb, uh, past, have, transitive, animate, third person on third person. Uh, un petit poulain, a little foal from French, un petit poulain. It's from, of course, Quebec French. Michif is based on Quebec French, not Parisian French. I can't pronounce Quebec French. But anyway, that's what a mixed sentence in Michif looks like. Miedni Aliud. Uh, the other commander island is Bieringa. And the Aliud spoken there is not mixed. So I've put that there for comparison. Uh, Bieringa Aliud is the left column, Miedni Aliud in the middle, and Russian in the right. Um, don't work. Uh, that's a singular imperative form. Awa la in Bieringa Eliut, Awa la Gala, Yedni Eliut Niabai, and the Aba is a cognate with the Awa uh, in Russian, Nyevarabatai, where the Nye, the particle, the negative particle, is a prefix in Yedni Eliut, remarkable for Eliut, which is otherwise exclusively suffixing, and the suffix is the Russian imperative. He or she sits with no gender distinction. Bjørninga unguchi kuch, sit present third singular. Bjørni uh, unguchit, sit present third singular, all combined into one in one flexional suffix. And Russian sidit. Um, he sat. He or she sat. Unguchi nach, sit past tense third singular. Bjørni um, aliud unguchi. Um, I don't know, the suffix is from the past masculine singular suffix in Russian, uh, and I don't know whether it's specifically masculine in Yedni Aliut, because the source I've seen this from doesn't say whether there's also umuchila, which would be the feminine. And may the lingua. Uh, the media lingua sentence is unu, I can't pronounce either of these languages, unu faburta pidigangabu bini huni, Spanish, vengo uh, para pedir un favor. Um, favor is borrowed into Quechua. So you see the Quechua still has that word, which is why uh, you can't see between the Quechua and the media lingua for the word for favor that. Uh, you have Spanish lexicon entirely in media lingua, but shuk faburda manga manya nga bu shamuhuni. You will notice that all the suffixes, uh, Quechua is exclusively suffixing, all the suffixes are Quechua. Um, the entire lexicon is Spanish. Bilingual mixed languages cannot have arisen uh, through ordinary gradual language change. Um, they don't resemble anything known from ordinary change contexts. Uh, they do resemble some things that you find in code switching. Mitchiff particularly looks as if it could be fossilized code switching because there are code switching contexts where noun phrases are code switched into matrix sentences uh, that are in the other language. Um, but not 
ordinary gradual language change. And furthermore, they develop too fast to be products of gradual contact-induced change of any kind. Um, both uh, Michif and um, uh, Yedni Eliud are 19th century um, creations. Uh, and it's, first of all, you don't get that kind of mixture uh, with two whole chunks of a language from different languages uh, in ordinary language change. And second, um, you certainly, if you could get it, you couldn't get it that fast. So they have to have been created deliberately. And in these cases, probably consciously, at least in part, because they have a very prominent social function of constructing a group identity. So my last topic, does deliberate change matter? That is, uh, so what? Um, is it just a curiosity of interest only to a few people or is it something that is of more general relevance? Well, first of all, it may occasionally matter if you're trying to determine genetic relationships. None of the examples I've given today um, are problematic in that respect because, uh, you know, the if you have, oh, let's see, if you have uisai with one dialect with masculine nouns corresponding to feminine nouns and the other and so forth, it still looks just like the other dialects in other respects. That is the agreement phenomena are the same. It's only the lexical uh, specification of the nouns that differ. Uh, and for Lambieke Quechua, you know, so you have word distortions, but you would still probably recognize that the words are cognate with the guys in the dialect next door. Um, but if the kinds of lexical distortion that you find in Moki and Lambieke Quechua and Lunfardo are pervasive enough, which is not, which is not a far-fetched notion, then cognacy with words in related languages could be obscured. Uh, likewise with the mens myronach, um, with lexical replacement, anything with lexical re extensive lexical replacement, which also happens. Um, and then that could defeat not only traditional efforts to establish genetic relationship, but it could also possibly defeat the kinds of um, modern uh, Bayesian uh, phylogenetic um, uh, trees, or they're not trees, but the um, producers of genetic related genetic relationships. Uh, and with bilingual mixed languages, you cannot assign them to a single language family unless you ignore at least one major component of the language. So you could take media lengua and you could say, oh, look, the vocabulary is Spanish. So this is a variety of Spanish or at least a descendant of Spanish. So well, that would be pretty bizarre when there's no Spanish grammar at all. And when you've got this quite elaborate um, Quechua grammar um, and you couldn't call it Quechua either when the lexicon is not Quechua. I don't think that my guess is, and I'm guessing that there are probably not that many cases where um, the kinds of deliberate changes I'm talking about could actually stymie efforts to establish genetic relationship. But deliberate change certainly matters for our understanding of processes of language change. And that's true even if we assume that it isn't really, really all that common. I think we have to assume that because the comparative method wouldn't work as well as it does to establish language families and reconstruct proto-languages for languages all over the world. It wouldn't work that well, it wouldn't work so well if sound change in particular were irregular a lot. Um, because the comparative method does work very well, we know that sound change usually is regular. So I wouldn't expect these kinds of deliberate changes to be, to be um, uh, the most common kind of change. Although I have no idea how common these kinds of changes are. But at least we have to accept the existence of deliberate change and we need to consider it in theory building. And in particular, it provides one more reason why we cannot hope to make valid deterministic predictions about sound change. So for instance, there are uh, theories out there that say that all sound change is phonetically based. Some of the deliberate changes I've talked about today give the lie to that. It can't be true because you can change your sounds. 
and you can change them in ways that would not be predicted by anything in the phonetics. Uh, and the same is true of some of the structural changes. I don't have anything much to say in the way of dramatic conclusions. I will assert with some confidence that there should no longer be any controversy at all about whether deliberate changes exist and more importantly about whether speakers can deliberately make really significant profound changes in their language. All they need is a big enough motive um, and such motives exist. Um, but we still don't know very much about the nature and frequency of deliberate changes. There is all sorts of room for further research. Uh, for instance, I don't know whether deliberate changes of most of the types I've talked about today can be identified long after they're completed. Some could be. Those bilingual mixed languages could certainly be spotted um, after the fact, as long as the source languages were still existent or at least documented. And Uisai's gender reversal, you would certainly notice that um, if both Uisai and the other dialects survive, maybe turned into separate languages uh, a few hundred years from now. Um, but some of the other things, particularly sound suppression, the, 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 um, the languages that are for censure avoid, some of those might be invisible. I mean, so you replace a labial trill with a plain B. I mean, that will look just like an ordinary sound change. So for all we know, some of the such changes of that sort in the past have been deliberate, but if so, we'll never know it. And um, the other question I particularly want to mention is whether there are any cognitive implications, and if there are any, what, they, what are they, uh, of the fact that speakers can and sometimes do change their language deliberately. Some of the things I've talked about today um, have met with skepticism at an annual meeting years ago of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in a symposium on language birth. I talked about bilingual mixed languages and, and during the question period, a linguist said, I don't believe this. I said, why don't you believe this? I, I don't believe these things exist. I said, you've got native speakers. I don't believe they, I mean, you know, there was, there was really serious skepticism, um, which made me think that maybe there are cognitive implications um, for this if people react so strongly against it. And then my final word is et cetera. That is to say, there probably are other uh, questions. In fact, I know there are other questions that just didn't occur to me while I was putting my slides together uh, that could be addressed on this topic. And I hope will be addressed. I'm not the only person interested in deliberate changes, but there aren't a lot of people, as far as I know, working on them specifically. And it's a great topic. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Professor, for, um, for your talk. It was very interesting. I have uh, some questions that I, people were posting while your talk um, was going on. And so the first um, question that I have here is that like, if there is like a preferred linguistic level that speakers uh, prefer to deliberately adjust to, like if, because we saw a lot of examples of uh, phonological and phonetic um, uh, deliberate changes. If you think there was like some kind of preference of what are your thoughts on that? That's from uh, Denise Bozani. Yeah. That's a good question. If I thought of it, I would have added it before the et cetera. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, because Ken Olson and I have been working on sound suppression on this project on sound suppression, Mm -hmm. uh, for that motive, at least, uh, the, uh, the censure avoidance. Um, all of the examples I have are of suppressed sounds, but I think that is just an artifact of th the particular project I'm involved in. I haven't tried very hard, for instance, to think of morphosyntactic examples of censure avoidance. Uh, it wouldn't be hard to think of things, consider ain't, um, those of you who teach linguistics to non-linguists, that is people who start out not knowing anything about linguistics, have probably noticed that convincing people that ain't is not a bad word is very difficult. 
Uh, and in fact, people who have it in their native dialect avoid it because they don't want to be sneered at, that kind of thing. So I know there's, that's only lexical, except that there's also a structural aspect to it because um, we're going home, aren't we, is the standard English way of saying that sentence. But it makes no sense grammatically. Sorry, I'm going home, aren't I? That makes no sense grammatically. Um, uh, I'm going home, ain't I, would make excellent sense back when ain't was not stigmatized. Um, so there is a grammatical aspect to it. So I think I could have thought, I could have thought of taught things like that, but I don't have examples. But some of the others, the, um, the bilingual mixed languages, I don't know. In fact, that would be bizarre. I don't know if anywhere the only thing that's adapted into one language from the other is the sound system. That would be weird. Um, so those examples are all structural. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the other motives. Uh, standardization. Standardization certainly normally involves um, proper pronunciation, but not always. A lot of time it's lexical. And in Avik's case, I don't know that he did any phonological stuff. It was all structural. Secrecy, um, a lot of those, particularly if you're playing with the words, word forms, those that the secrecy motive would give you a lot of phonological stuff. But that's not all they did with Moki. They also stuck prefixes on words. And this was in a language that didn't have a lot of prefixes. Um, and new suffixes. So some of that was morphosyntactic too, morphological anyway. Distancing. Yeah, a lot of those were phonological too, weren't they? But not all, certainly not the Uisai example. That was not phonological. So I don't have any sense. I don't have any intu strong intuitions about it, but at least I don't have any sense that somehow phonology rules in deliberate changes. Mm -hmm. Might. Yeah. Might. <laughs> yeah, I actually, the dialect that I studied, there was a very fast uh, change in the dialect to a more like standard one in the past like 40 years. And so it's like, I think it falls into the category of standardization and, and most of the, the, the changes were in the, in the grammar. So yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there significant phonological differences between this dialect and neighboring dialects? There are. are there, you wouldn't expect phonology to do much if there's no phonological variation that's relevant. Yeah, there are some, but like they're not. It's just like that I noticed at least there's just one sound that changed a little bit, but like most of like 90% of the changes are all in the grammar in the more synthetic level. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, um, so I have um, some other questions. So just like a comment from Hugo Salgado. Uh, he said that as a native of El Salvador, where Teteopeque Pipil was spoken, he said that I can tell you that this variety of Pipil is now extinct. Uh, thus, we cannot know whether the change you mentioned reached completion because it's spoken more, yeah. Did he say anything about his, did he have any intuitions about that particular change? Did he know what it was like before it was extinct? I can ask. Uh, let's see if he says um, But in the way that would be like the, like Joe Aeneas and his, and his ditransit, Englishy ditransitives, right? It was a potential change, mm -hmm. but there won't be time for it to happen because, you know, there aren't going to be native fluent speakers, although the revitalization program is robust. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, like a question from uh, Ana Livia Agostinho. So she said that the in the endangered Creole language that she works with, uh, the young people claim that the elders do not want them to know what they are saying, so they don't use the language with them. So, thinking about the situations you presented, could you talk about the relation between the liberal language change in language endangerment and death? Yeah, that's sad. That's a sad situation. Um, withholding the language so that, I mean, in, in a way, what the elders are doing is a secrecy motive, right? Um, there are cases out there. 
I don't know of a case like that one exactly, but there are cases of languages that have vanished because the elders were fluent native speakers of the language, the heritage language. And the young people, this, this, I'm thinking about a case, it was one of the Chinookan languages, I think, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Uh, the young people were bilingual in English and Chinookan. And because the schooling and everything was in English, that was their dominant language. And when they spoke Chinookan, they made mistakes and the elders laughed at them and the kids just shifted because who needs to be laughed at? There were cases like that in, um, in the Midwest among immigrant communities in the United, again, in the United States. Um, there was one with Swedish immigrants where there were different Swedish dialects, some of them more prestigious than others. And the kids in this one family kept being laughed at by their peers because they had this funny dialect. And so they just shifted to English because if you're bilingual, you've got a choice. In one of your languages, you don't get laughed at. In the other language, you do. Who needs it? So you shift. And it's really sad. Um, I hope it's not very common with endangered languages because, um, because how awful. Endangered languages have enough threats without also having a generational divide furthering the endangerment process. Exactly, yeah. Okay, uh, so last class is the Megotoi. Uh, so she, she said, Andrea Menegoto from Argentina. She said like, have you studied the effects of the feminist movement on the deliver language change in any language? I haven't. That's an interesting question, too. That's another thing that would have been good in the et cetera, um, before the et cetera, in my last um, list of things you could look at. Um, Leboff and the, in the you know, therefore the whole variation of sociolinguistic um, uh, community uh, has argued that women lead changes. And, you know, there's good evidence for that in the, in the cultures he studied. Um, I don't know how general that is in other kinds of cultures. I know of at least one case in Mexico uh, where the, let's see, it was a Zapotecan community and um, the women felt that the kids would be better served to become Spanish speakers, not Zapotec speakers because there was a factory not far away and you could get a job there if you knew Spanish. So in this village, they decreed that everybody should just speak Spanish. And so the only people left in the village speaking Zapotec were some old men who weren't swayed enough by the women's opinion. Um, and that too is a, a way of killing a language. Uh, but, but what role women play in hunter-gatherer communities very small communities, dialect communities generally, I don't know. I don't know if there are interesting gender differences. I don't know whether Leboff's model of women leading changes would carry over to cultures where there aren't dominant classes, where education is not, a, is not an issue, differential education. I don't know. It would be good to know. That is very interesting. Um, and uh, Ana Sueli Arruda Câmara uh, Cabral asks, uh, Sally, differences between male and female speech um, can arise as deliberately changes? It's related to that question. To... Hi, Ana Sueli. <laughs> <laughs> I figure she's listening or she... Or... <laughs> so that was the same question? Basically, oh, that's a different question. So she said, if the difference between male and female speech can arise as deliberately changes. Ah, well, it certainly did in that Atayao community in um, on Taiwan, in Taiwan, that is where the men's Myronach um, ritual hunting language, and this is not unique. I mean, the other famous case is uh, in the Caribbean when a uh, uh, one indigenous group 
overcame the other indigenous group and ended up with a culture where there were women from the conquered group and they spoke one language and the men spoke another men's language, women's language. That's a different type of situation. But I don't think it's probably, my guess, sorry, again, I'm guessing, is that it's probably not all that unusual for men's, for ritual or hunting or whatever special men's purposes to have um, to have their own speech. Uh, Ken Hale's story of the, the ritual language of the Lardeal in Australia was a ritual language. And I think that was only spoken by men. I think it was part of initiation into, into manhood that boys were given this language. So I'd guess that that's not wildly uncommon, but again, I have no idea how common it is. And notice those are not Western societies. I mean, the ones the examples I know of are not in Western societies. Yeah, so Anna in a Babel said this, that there was a great question, especially with the changes um, going on with Spanish gender to the feminist uh, LBGTQ movement. I think she's probably referring to the, at least like in Spanish, uh, there was like the X, you know, like all these changes are right. deliberate. Yeah if you have like any thoughts about it. I don't, I wish I did. Mm -hmm. She's certainly right that it's an important topic. Mm -hmm. I'm ignorant and I'm really ignorant of Spanish. So to say something to either you or Anna about Spanish would make me very nervous. I was kind of nervous about including Spanish examples but I had to have examples. So. Okay. Um... And Adail Sobral uh, said that, may we say that in, in, in a way all changes arise from social communication needs? I wouldn't actually. Um, I think people have fun with language and some creativity is for fun. I've heard that reported as a motive for some of what goes on in the development of the African urban youth languages where you have multilingual people, people from different language backgrounds and a lot of them are multilingual, probably most of them, maybe all of them, and they create a new language. And on the one hand, it might be for secrecy, it might be for, you know, identity, you know, group, in-group construction, uh, but at least partly it's for fun. So no, I don't think it all has to do with communicative needs. And certainly the bilingual uh, mixed languages have nothing to do with communicative needs. Their development doesn't because these people had two languages already. They could just have used one or they could have kept on using both of them. They didn't need another language for communication. They only needed it for us, our language, rather than those other guys' language. Yes. Uh, yeah, Emma said, like, in Argentina, people are using E rather than A and O in gender morphology. And that's very, actually, that's a very, it's a common uh, phenomenon too in, in Brazilian Portuguese. So you, instead of using A or O, they are changing it to A at the end. Why? Mm -hmm. it, it's a way of, like, not marking the gender. Oh, that. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, and all those efforts to find a general neutral pronoun in English when they could have just gone with singular right. they for the, to begin with, uh, yeah. with already in the language. Yes. Yes. All of that, that actually is a type of language planning. Uh, the motive I use the label for, the, the label I use for the motive is standardization, but language planning is not all done by governments. Um, there's language planning. I mean, look at the UESI example has to be, have been a case of language planning in some sense. We're too much like those guys next door. How about we switch all these genders? I mean, it, it, it has to have been something like that, which you could do in a small community. And with the, with the uh, gender neutral pronouns and the Spanish, and you say it's happening in Portuguese too? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the invention of a new suffix to eliminate the OA distinction, um, that's language planning. Mm -hmm. Is it working? I guess in Argentina, I, I think it is. I, I think it's, it's very common apparently. Um, Aren't there are a lot of people who say, oh, this is terrible. I guess, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the kind of change that you get a lot of resistance to typically. Yeah. I remember, I remember, because I'm old, uh, what it was like when um, generic masculine pronoun were supposed to be eliminated in English. Mm -hmm. um, it took a long time. Now it's pretty standard, but there were people who were really unhappy about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen in the literature people, you know, linguists, historical linguists saying, well, you know, this isn't, I, I'm not comfortable with this. It's not a natural change. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, I mean, it's certainly deliberate change, right? Eliminating generic he. Yeah. Um, whether it's natural or not depends on your definition of natural. I said at the very beginning of my talk that I'm not gonna try to define natural, um, but it seems to me that deliberate changes are natural. They're mm -hmm. not ordinary sorts of gradual changes, but that doesn't make them somehow unnatural. Mm -hmm. I'm still not gonna try to define natural though. Yeah. Um, uh, so another question, so she, so from, yes, yeah, so you say, would you use a Labovia methods to study deliberately change or other methods? That's from Andrea Menegoto too, from Argentina. Interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of what I have done. I'm afraid, I mean, most of my examples, not all of them, but most of them come from language contact. So I've come across them in doing language contact research. And in some cases I looked at the change and I thought, you know, obviously it's a contact induced change. This is weird, it has to have been deliberate. And then I tried to see if I can think of evidence for that or why they did it. I have not developed a methodology. I'm not sure it would be possible to do so, but somebody cleverer than I am might be able to. I've not developed a methodology for finding deliberate changes. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that discovering deliberate changes is most likely to be done by people who are working on this dialect of a particular language or that particular language that's in close contact with other languages and then seeing what happens. But if I were going to devise a project to go look for um, deliberate changes and if I were maybe 30 or 40 years younger, uh, I'd go to New Guinea because that's a place where, as Kulik said, you know, it seems to be a thing. Um, the first field worker who um, investigated non-Austronesian New Guinea languages commented that um, you go from village to village and you find that the grammars are very similar, but the vocabulary is all different. And I don't know if that observation, I don't know to what extent, if any, it's held up because that was many decades ago. Um, but it does make you wonder if maybe uh, given the predilection of a lot of people in New Guinea for these distancing changes, if maybe some of those great differences in the vocabularies were done by people making their language different from the guys next door. Anyway, that's where I'd go. Yeah. Maybe the Peruvian Amazon, from what Lev Michael said, there's a lot of that going on there too. But, but New Guinea, which has about a seventh of the world's languages um, crunched into a not very huge space, um, would be a place where you, you would certainly expect to find a lot of them. And maybe get an idea of the scope and the likelihood of phonological versus non-phonological, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I have a, just I think a final question, uh, the, the idea of awareness. Uh, so you think, so the whole like, if speakers have to be aware to, to make these deliberate changes. And what do you think is the, is basically the role of awareness in, in this kind of changes? Well, I'm happier if I can look at a change and say they have to have known what they were doing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That is, they have to have been aware like the Uisai gender switch, like the bilingual mixed languages. I don't, you know, it just seems wildly unlikely that those would happen just accidentally mm -hmm. without people noticing what they were doing. But, but I, I don't think it's possible for most of these changes to prove 
that people were fully conscious of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And as I read the uh, communication accommodation theory literature, uh, the Giles work and his colleagues, it looks as if they actually are not making a clear distinction between deliberate changes, it's not their term, but accommodations that are conscious and ones that aren't. That is, they're all accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, as I said at the beginning when I was talking about that, um, you could challenge my view that you could have deliberate but unconscious changes. That is, people could have social motivations that they're not aware of. Mm -hmm. One question is whether they could become aware of them. Surely they could. And because they could, right? Because, you know, why are you talking like that? That's not the way you normally talk. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about it, well, it's because he talks and I admire him. So I want to talk like, I mean, you know, you, if you think about it, you could realize what you were doing. And that's why I don't feel too nervous. Although you can tell by the way I'm argle bargling around here that I'm slightly insecure about it. That's why I don't feel too uncomfortable about talking about deliberate but not fully conscious changes. And in the case of accommodation, if I'm gonna talk, that is if I'm talking more like this other guy um, and I'm not noticing that I'm doing it, okay, that's not full conscious awareness. But what if I don't like the other guy? And I don't like the way he talks. And I want to make sure I'm not talking like that. I might not be doing that with full awareness either. But the fact that I have that, those two choices seems to me to bring deliberation into the picture. That is, it is a choice. And whether you're fully aware of the choice you're making or not, it still seems to me to be a deliberate choice. But as I say, I can imagine people that I might not consider totally reasonable, but pretty reasonable disagreeing with me on this point. I don't know how far I'd push it. That's very interesting. So we're having one more question. Um, what is your opinion about the duality? Um, on, on the one hand, the language change occurring, any directionality going back and forth. On the other hand, the, 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 princip the principle of, least, of the least afford uh, or the simple to complex theory. It was from least what? Uh, simple, what? Simple to Somehow you cut out partly. What's the principle? Uh, the the principle of uh, least effort and the simple to complex theory. Ah. I, I don't believe in the principle of least effort. <laughs> that is, I don't believe that language change is governed by the principle of least effort in any global sense. Uh, some changes are. Mm -hmm. Some changes aren't. And deliberate changes definitely aren't. That is, these changes that where you're dealing with accommodation, distancing, secrecy, standardization, center avoidance, identity construction, you're talking about creativity in those cases. You're talking about people doing things for a social purpose. I don't think least effort enters into it. And I'm not actually convinced that least effort is, it, it's, it's something that's sometimes invoked as a deterministic principle, right? That's what language change is like. I just don't believe it even for non-deliberate changes. There's too much else going on. Um, homophony avoidance, uh, construction ambiguity, things that would dictate a change that might not be less effort, it might be more effort, but, um, but on the other hand, it makes it more different from this other utterance so that you don't have people misunderstanding you, that kind of thing. And there's all sorts of things that go on in ordinary gradual language change that I think don't have anything to do with least effort and maybe go in the other direction. Yeah, I agree with you. And I studied uh, this double, double negation phenomenon and that's a, an example, like that you're adding more material. It's like, you cannot explain that with least effort, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Professor uh, Sarah you, Thompson. Anna. It was a pleasure to have you in this event from a Berlin and uh, and a Berlin and all the community, the linguistics uh, community is thanking you for, for your talk. Uh, and just as a reminder for people who are watching that you guys um, uh, are welcome to become an associate of uh, a Berlin. 
and to support uh, uh, Brazilian linguistics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Obrigado.